Señor Burgner, yo quisiera comenzar por algo sencillo, algo que es eh, aparentemente obvio para mucha gente. ¿Qué es la felicidad? Well, that's a very complicated uh, question, and uh, yes, the problem is that there is no definition of happiness. Everyone has his own definition. The only thing you can say is that uh, happiness is more than the absence of, of adversity. It's something different. It's, it's an emotional quality of life, and you can say you're happy when you live in a kind of uh, oasis of peace and far from the concerns of everyday life. Um, so that's why happiness cannot happen every day, every hour, every second. It's an uh, enchanted moment, which you don't always realize when you're happy. But when, in, in retrospect, when you remember, you say, oh my God, at this time I was so happy, I did not, didn't know it. And um, so, you know, we should be very careful by defining happiness. The only thing we can say about happiness is that it's a uh, it's, um, provisional moment. It cannot go around during all your life. It's a small um, instance of felicity, not a constant state. Un pesimista podría decir hoy, bueno, sí, es cierto que la ilustración nos libró de los prejuicios de la minoría de edad, pero nos ha dejado como herencia la obligación de ser felices. Yes, that's exactly what my book is about, and uh, it's an illustration of the way into which an ideal, the right to be happy, can turn into its contrary, the duty to be happy, and that's exactly what I can. I try to uh, tell in my book is this change which happened slowly during the 19th and 20th century and then uh, came out in the 60s. Because suddenly in the 60s, two uh, main uh, things happened. First of all, the capitalistic system itself started to speak in terms of happiness. Because uh, the first capitalism was about asceticism. You had to work in order to produce goods. And in the middle of the 20th century, there were too many goods and overproduction of commodities which you had to sell. So overnight, capitalism started to speak the language of enjoyment, the language of consumption. So you had not only to be a worker, but a consumer. And then happiness became the motto of most big corporations. We are concerned about your happiness. And second thing also which happened in the 60s is that this is the beginning of the individualistic revolution and then uh, which places the individual in the center of all values. And then between me and my happiness, there are no more obstacles, no more church, no more religion, no more political party, no more social class, and I'm the main obstacle to my own happiness. So I have to reform myself in order to, to become happy. And then you open this huge market of happiness, which, is, um, which exists everywhere, in, in Europe, in the United States, and in South America, and which goes from medicine, you know, taking pills to regulate your moods, uh, plastic surgery, which is so strong in South America for young girls and young boys from 12, 13, building the body of your dream, to uh, therapies, uh, psychoanalysis, but also primal, uh, uh, scream, uh, personal development, uh, neuro-linguistic uh, programmation, and all this, which helps you to uh, rediscover your potential. And then religion, mainly Protestantism, which try to uh, mix uh, the sense of transcendence with a sense of self-fulfillment. And uh, that's why happiness is going to be the, the biggest market of the 21st century. And that's how a, a beautiful ideal, which was uh, coined in the 17th, 18th century, has turned into the biggest industry of the 21st one. Usted ocupa frecuentemente el término 
hedonismo, y que tiene, por lo menos en el diccionario español, una definición magnífica, afán desmedido por los bienes terrenales. Yo quisiera agregar ahora otra palabra, que es menos conocida por la gente de a pie. Misantropía, aversión a los seres humanos. Curioso, la democracia es vivir juntos y hoy aumenta la misantropía. Well, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a good question, and uh, if, I, if you allow me to make a diversion, I would say that, for instance, ec 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 the ecology, which is supposed to be the defense of nature and earth, in my eyes, is more and more the disgust of humankind. You know, the ecologists claim to love uh, glaciers, forests, cliffs, sceneries, landscapes, but when you dig their, their, their rhetoric, most of the time, it's a way not to like humanity anymore. So under the love of nature, you have the hatred of mankind. And it's, it's probably due to the fact, which I told you previously, that we are seven billions of human beings on, on the earth today. Finding places where you're just on your own, except going in the high mountains of your own country, or even in the Alps, even in summertime, even at 4,000 meters, you have multitudes climbing. I, I, I love uh, mountain climbing, but in August, if you're in the Alps, trying to do a very high peak, you have people waiting in line, you know, just to reach the summit. And so, misanthropy is a reaction to the proliferation of the human being on this earth. I think this is the main explanation. You have many reasons not to like your fellow companions, but the number, maybe, is, a, is, a, is, a, is the most important one. Escuchando esta declaración, hago aquí un paréntesis. No me extraña que a usted eh, lo acusen de algo, porque se trata de un discurso políticamente incorrecto. Yes, a lot of people don't like it, but a lot of people like it too. And uh, I think if you write books, it's you have to disclose the truth. You don't write books just to please people. And uh, you have precisely to understand those odd phenomena which you underlined in your question. Why, in a time of democracy, uh, do so many people turn into misanthropy? Instead of enjoying the company of others, why do so many people start hating their own society and writing bad, bad things about, about it? And um, so that's why sometimes you have to be politically incorrect. Sir Brugner, ¿puede un pobre ser feliz? Of course, everybody can be happy, but uh, without money, it's very, very difficult. I think we have to break this connection which has been made by the Catholic religion, the connection between poverty, spirituality, and salvation. I, I've been brought up by the Jesuits in, in, in France, and um, you know, I've been repeated all my youth, you need to be poor, and you have to deprive yourself of material goods, you have to sacrifice yourself for the others. The, the same people who told me that had a lot of money. And so uh, we have to say like the ancients, Greeks, Ancient Greek and Latin said that money and health are preferable to poverty and disease. And, uh, and uh, of course, money will not bring you happiness, but it considerably helps you to be happy if you, you, know, if you don't have to worry every day how to make ends meet, how to, to feed your children. If you want to go um, for a trip, if you don't have the money, you're obliged to stay at home. So uh, it's about time to not to be hypocritical. Yes, money helps you to be happy, and good health too. And everybody knows it, but uh, uh, nobody wants to say it. There was a very good line by a French writer called Jules Renard. And he says in his uh, diary, if money doesn't make you happy, give it back. <laughs> Which I find excellent. <laughs> yeah, well, well. Yes. Una de las publicidades hasta el día de hoy, una de las publicidades más eh, 
frecuentes en América Latina, es la que dice lo siguiente. Compre hoy, pague mañana. Es decir que es un gran alivio, podemos adquirir lo que queramos. Y ya veremos más adelante cómo nos arreglamos en el camino. Usted dice con razón que no somos dueños de las fuentes de la felicidad, que nuestra propia muerte debería llevarnos a una humildad renovada. Perdone mi escepticismo, la idea del consumismo tiene al parecer todas las de ganar frente a esta humildad que usted pregona y que yo comparto. But the, the fact that we are going to die and we all know that should not prevent us from living. And um, the humility about, about death, which was preached by all the religions and philosophies, is a, a way to um, is a way to fight human pride. Consumerism is about something else. Consumerism as it is lived today in South America, in Europe, in North America, in a crazy way, is, is, a, um, is a mean to obtain everything you desire at the very moment. This is the invention of credit, which happened in the 20s in, in the United States, in the 50s in France, in Europe, Uh, which is a way to say that frustration is the worst experience that a human being can do and satisfaction is the most beautiful one. And um, so I don't think it's really connected to the fact that we are going to die. Uh, the, only, uh, the only risk that we run by buying things in credits, we have two risks. First is no there, you know, you have too many useless things which you throw away afterwards because, you know, you, you bought uh, 10 copies of the same item, clothes, uh, things like this. And the second one is to be indebted. So we arrive to the subprime crisis. The Americans lived 12, 20, 30 times above the, the real um, uh, possessions. And that one, and overnight they found themselves dispossessed of everything. And uh, I agree with you. Consumerism, when it reaches this uh, crazy stadium, should be um, should be hampered. It should, it should be uh, contained, because you know nobody can live like this for a long time. Si hemos cerrado en algo tan importante como la felicidad. No deberíamos buscar una nueva narración, y no me refiero a las ideologías totalitaristas del pasado, sino que liberados de ellas, un nuevo sueño, una nueva esperanza. You're right, we cannot come back to the religious traditions of the old world. You, nobody will accept today, not even a Catholic, not even a Protestant, the fact that you live to die and then to be uh, eventually uh, salvaged in heaven, uh, sitting next to God, where all your sins will be redeemed. And nobody will accept the fact that the existence is designed to suffer. And then, you know, after 50, 60, 70 years of hard life, you will find a uh, beatitude. Uh, sitting next to the Christ. Even Christians do not believe that anymore. So what we have to reconcile is the idea of happiness with the idea of um, human fragility, you know. Uh, th that maybe this is a kind of you know, narrative that you were claiming for. But maybe, maybe the most important thing we should um, defend is the fact that whatever happens, in, in, uh, we remain the master of, of our own life. And maybe this is a real freedom of each of us, that we, we can design our life as we wish it to be. Uh, whether happy or unhappy, at least it will be our life. Aunque sean pocas, yo quiero hacer un par de preguntas sobre este libro que es muy importante para mí, La Tentación de la Inocencia, publicado en español hace ya 16 años atrás. 
dos formas de tentación de la inocencia. Primero, la infantilización. Es decir, querer sentirnos eh, protegidos. Eh, quiero que me den, pero no que me pidan. No está mal la idea. A lo mejor si le hiciéramos publicidad, mucha más gente se uniría a esta corriente. Well, this book is about the pathologies of freedom. As I just said before, I think the, the main uh, gift that democracy gives us is the possibility of designing our life as we mean it. You know, um, democracy is the end of fate. In the old time, in the ancient regime, everyone was predestined to a certain kind of life. If you were an aristocrat, you had a, a great life. If you were a merchant, you had uh, the duties of this uh, condition. But if you were a poor peasant, you were doomed to remain a poor peasant, and your children too, and your grandchildren also. Democracy tried to break this weight of uh, destiny on everybody's shoulders. So now, in principle, we're free to build our life as uh, we want. But at the same time, freedom is extremely concerning, is, is extremely worrisome, because being free means that you're very insecure. And in order to protect ourselves from this insecurity, we have developed two strategies, infantilization and victimization. And, uh, of course, infantilization is a delightful aspiration because we would like, as an adult, to enjoy all our physical and psychological autonomy without being responsible for our acts. Uh, we, would, we would like to act like uh, kids in a kindergarten, you know. We can do whatever we want, but don't ask me any responsibility for it. I'm free and I do whatever I want. And in fact, uh, and in fact, we would like to be like small kings, smoking, uh, saying permanently, I want and I demand. And uh, this is the um, appearance of the generation, I deserve it, I deserve everything. You have to give me everything and I don't have any, anything to give, to give back. And, but we see that uh, this kind of uh, attitude is s socially not possible for everyone. Because uh, one day or another you have to, to pay for what you do and you have to feel responsible for your acts. And if you just consider one small aspect of this problem, the relationship between parents and children, you have many parents nowadays in, in France, but I think it's the same in Chile, who make, make kids and then get rid of them. You know, they don't want to, uh, to take care of them, and so they, they, they lay their kids out as a hen lay eggs, and they know they, 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 they run away. This is very unresponsible. And so this infantilization is extremely funny and, and, and moving sometimes, but you know, it, 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 it's, it's not coherent with a responsible life. Y del otro lado, la victimización. No se me quiere reconocer lo que valgo. Siempre me persigue. Eh, las cosas no están bien. Por lo tanto, yo soy una víctima. Este me parece a mí un fenómeno que va increciendo en los tiempos que vivimos. ¿Por qué? Uh -huh. Oh, uh, why? For many reasons. Uh, first, uh, democracy requires from every one of us never to be satisfied with his own condition. You can always have better than what you have. That's exactly what they say at the office, in the fabric. You know, as I said before, I deserve better. Uh, my friends, have better salaries. Why is my salary so low? I'm going to ask for an increase. So um, democracy asks us never to be happy with our lot. That's, that's the first thing. Second reason for victimization, we are the inheritors of 
a tragic century, 20, 20 centuries, with uh, genocides and the great totalitarianism. And uh, the position of victim, of people who have suffered a lot, has by a very uh, tortuous way become extremely desirable. Because if you're a, a victim, you escape uh, the normal right. You have every kind of right you want. Nobody can accuse you because being a victim, you're outside of all jurisdiction. You have suffered, so people owe you, and they owe you forever. And the dream of most citizens in our democracy is to be a victim without ever suffering of anything, which is, of course, totally absurd. So you, all, you can always find persecutors. You can say your parents raped you, your parents uh, have been terrible with you, your brothers and sisters have been um, awful with you when you were young, your teachers, your professors were t terrible with you, you can say that your boss is persecuting you. And um, this model of the victim is extremely popular. As you say, it's increasing everywhere because um, you receive all the advantages and you have nothing to pay back. And uh, being a victim is most people's dream, even in love life, you know, even in love life. You love someone, and then after a few years you say, but you persecute me, you, you're extracting everything from me. You, you, you're stealing my energy, you're stealing my soul. And uh, that's why you see so many lovers who were tenderly attached to each other, turning into enemies and leaving themselves as victims of the other's uh, malignity. And uh, we have to resist every day to the very simple fact to think that uh, someone else is responsible for my misery. You know, I, I feel miserable, someone else must be guilty for it. No, unfortunately, it's not always the case. Sometimes you're a real victim, but most of the time, you're only your own victim. Casi al finalizar su libro, usted dice que no debemos albergar ilusiones demasiado grandes que la liberación de los oprimidos no se va a producir. Suena pesimista. Well, what, what I said at the end of this book is the liberation of all oppressed people, but uh, against all kind of uh, pessimistic philosophies of history, what we see today in the Arab world proves the contrary. Because, you know, for years, uh, a cliche used to say that the Arab world was doomed to Islamism on one hand and dictatorship on the other hand. And what we see since December is something absolutely new, uh, absolutely um, astonishing. Uh, 400 million of Arabs in the Middle East and in, in Maghreb trying to fight in very complicated ways for dignity and freedom. And that's why history sometimes can reserve good surprises. But of course, we cannot dream of a world where every, where all the oppressed people will be liberated. But at least, little by little, North Africa, uh, the Middle East, and maybe uh, tomorrow, Sub-Saharan Africa, will raise to, for, for, for its rights. And that's extremely encouraging. El solo hecho que se celebre hoy mientras conversamos aquí en Tilburg, en Holanda, un día por la filosofía, ¿no le parece alentador, aunque sea un aliento pequeñito? Well, apparently it's not only one day, it's one day in Tilburg, but uh, they have many days in Amsterdam and, and other cities. I think it's not bad, It, it's a good sign because I remember 10 years ago in France, um, they were speaking of suppressing the classes of philosophy in high school and uh, little by little philosophy which was uh, supposed to be reduced and uh, annihilated from the program is coming back not through school, not through university, but through the society. And what we realize in Europe, and I think it's the same in South America because we're the same culture, 
the concerns for the main issues of human conditions are extremely important in today's society. We are a secularized society, de-Christianized societies, at least in Western Europe. But um, the, the, the most important philosophical concerns remain extremely strong um, uh, among people. Why do we have to die? What is the meaning of life? What is a good life? Can we succeed um, through love? Uh, should we consider ourselves as victims? Uh, can we infantilize ourselves without being, uh, without regressing to the stadium of, of children? And what is freedom? And all those, those questions uh, which seem um, uh, futile or which seem shallow, in fact, uh, come back through um, people's concerns. That's why uh, a day for philosophy is extremely important. And. Uh, the same things are happening now, now in France also. We have the same uh, magazine, Philosophy magazine in, in France. And most and more, more and more people in villages, in small cities, or in big cities, in cafe, uh, gather to talk about philosophical problems, which is a way to repossess philosophy, uh, which is not only the business of a few uh, scholar people, but we should be everyone's concern. Señor Pascal Brunner, muchísimas gracias a nombre de Radio Negra por esta gentileza. Gracias a usted. Ah, <laughs>